All right. Welcome to our third panel of today's Freedom of Thought Conference, where we are discussing the role of states in, pres per in preserving freedom. I'm Alita Kass, Vice President for Strategic Initiatives and Director of the Freedom of Thought Project. Our next panel will focus on corporate speech and the First Amendment. Thank you again to our audience here in person and those watching online, and thanks in advance to our panelists and moderator, Judge Lisa Branch sits on the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, and we are delighted to have her here to moderate this discussion. Judge Branch, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Alita. Thank you for, uh, for this conference, for all that you are contributing um, to the freedom of thought, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm always honored to serve as a moderator on a Federalist Society panel, even if it means flying to the swamp during the summer months. I, I, I knew I was here. I lived here for four and a half years. I knew I was back home, so to speak, when I landed in the haze uh, was making the visibility at the airport uh, quite low this morning. So, um, and before we get started, uh, due to the nature of the panel's topic, I note that I'm offering no opinions on any matter that is pending or could come before my court. I am participating as moderator simply to facilitate discussion among the panelists, and I thank you. Um, but in, in any event, welcome to our afternoon panel, which is entitled Corporate Speech and the First Amendment. And today we are going to explore how and to what extent uh, the First Amendment applies to corporations. Um, and let's start with uh, what we know about this issue uh, from some fairly well-known and recent cases of the Supreme Court. Certainly in 2010, uh, Citizens United versus FEC, the Supreme Court told us that the government cannot suppress corporate political speech. And in 2014, the Supreme Court issued Burwell v. Hobby Lobby, holding that federal regulations placing restrictions on the free exercise rights uh, of a for-profit, closely held corporation must comply with RIFRA. And in 2018, the court held in the National Institute of Family and Life Advocates, NIFLA, uh, v. Bursera, that it, doesn't, um, that it doesn't recognize professional speech as a separate category of speech subject to diminished constitutional protection. Uh, but there are many open issues that remain. Do First Amendment interests and protections apply in the same way to closely held corporations as, uh, as they do to widely held publicly traded corporations? What was the founding era understanding of corporate rights and of state power to protect individual rights? And how does the role of states in protecting freedoms intersect with corporate speech? Our distinguished, distinguished panel will address these issues during its discussion. I will briefly introduce the panelists in the order in which they will speak, and each will give brief opening remarks. They will then have an opportunity to respond to each other, and I may also have questions. And I hope to open uh, this up to audience Q&A by 3 o'clock at the latest. Um, let me first start with Elliot Geyser who was an associate at Jones Day. Before um, joining Jones Day in 2022, he served as a law clerk to Justice Alito. Uh, he also served as a law clerk to Judge Rao of the DC Circuit Court of Appeals and to Judge Edith Jones of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. He attended Hillsdale College and received his JD from the University of Chicago. Mr. Geyser will discuss how two distinct historic visions of corporate law may have implications and raise important questions about the rights and duties of corporations. Uh, Mr. Maddox uh, is the Vice President for Legal and Judicial Strategy at the Americans for Prosperity. Uh, for over 15 years before joining AFP, his legal career focused on defending the First Amendment rights of students, faculties, family, healthcare workers, and religious organizations. He has a JD from Boston College School of Law and a BA in Government and History from the University of Virginia. Mr. Maddox will talk about the text and history of the First Amendment and what it tells us about the First Amendment right of corporations or organizations to speak. Professor Kandub is a professor of law and director of the Intellectual Property, Information, and Communications Law Program at Michigan State University. Prior to joining MSU, he served uh, as an advisor at the Federal Communications Commission, 
from, uh, he was also a litigation associate in DC at Jones Day. Uh, immediately, uh, he went to Yale undergrad and the University of Pennsylvania for law school. Immediately following law school, he clerked for Chief Judge Wallace of the US Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. He joined the Trump administration in 2019 as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Telecommunications and Information, and then assumed the role as the Acting Assistant Secretary. He later joined the Department of Justice as Deputy uh, Associate Attorney General. Professor Kandub will take a more pragmatic approach to the question and explain why corporations don't have and shouldn't have full First Amendment rights. And Jim Campbell serves as the chief legal counsel with Alliance Defending Freedom, where he leads the US legal advocacy team. Prior to joining ADF in March of 2023, he was the Solicitor General in the office of the Nebraska Attorney General. In February 2023, um, he argued Biden v. Nebraska before the US Supreme Court. And after graduating from the University of Akron School of Law, he clerked for Judge Batchelder of the US Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. Mr. Campbell will discuss whether uh, free speech rights apply differently to different types of corporations and will explore the problems of large corporations refusing to work with certain individuals or groups because of their speech. Mr. Geiser. Well, thank you, Judge, and thank you all for being here and to the Federalist Society for the opportunity to speak to you today. And needless to say, I speak for myself alone and not on behalf of my employer or anybody else for that matter. I want to begin with a debate you've probably heard before. Someone on the left says that certain speech is offensive or harmful to vulnerable groups or corrupting to the political process by drowning out individual voices and should result in social or legal sanctions. Hence the online comments section slogan, free speech does not mean freedom from consequences. Then of course a classical liberal or a conservative responds that this is wrong because the First Amendment creates a marketplace of ideas where the answer to offensive speech is more speech and competition on the merits. And then, of course, in answer to this argument, the Gen Z college student complaining about offensive words says, ah, I get it, I understand now, and then puts down the TikTok video. Well, you've at least heard the first part of that debate. I think what might be going on is this. When those who love the First Amendment defend it in terms of the marketplace of ideas, we generally mean a free market. But most progressives I know have never met a market that they wouldn't prefer regulated. And the marketplace of ideas in their eyes is subject, like any other market, to market failures, unfair market power, and inequality that needs to be corrected with central planning, whether in content moderation, trigger warnings, or subsidies to center marginalized voices. So I think legal conservatives should abandon recourse to the rhetoric of the marketplace of ideas, because it probably doesn't persuade anyone who doesn't already agree that the Bill of Rights and free enterprise system are a work of genius. More deeply, and I say this as an incorrigible UChicago law and economics booster, the best defense of the First Amendment is rooted not in the language of economic utility, but in the created dignity of the human person, and stands on the proposition that the predicate of government by the consent of the governed is the freedom of thought to which this conference is dedicated. So rather than intone to ourselves again the virtues of the marketplace of ideas, I think instead we should reinvigorate our ideas about the marketplace and some of the speakers in the non-metaphorical but very real market corporations. To that end, we might map the topography of two visions of the nature of the corporation for purposes of constitutional rights to speech, due process, and more, and then ask whether that changes the constitutional analysis. Borrowing from the work of Reuven Avillon and Roger Murkowski, I would like to map these theories along a continuum perhaps between two poles, both of which have a solid historical pedigree in American law. The first pole is the idea that the corporation is ultimately an aggregate association of individual natural persons. To witness the aggregate association theory in action, we begin with no less a founding luminary of American law than Chief Justice Marshall in his 1809 case, Bank of the United States versus Duvall, and we heard a little bit about the Bank of the United States earlier. There, the state of Georgia attempted to tax the Savannah branch of that bank, a membership corporation established by Congress. The bank refused to pay the tax, the state sent its collectors, and the bank sued the collectors in diversity in federal court. The Supreme Court took up the question whether a corporation made up of members from one state could sue citizens of another state in federal court on diversity grounds, which required deciding the antecedent question between two views, whether 
the individual character of the members of the corporation is so wholly lost in that of the corporation that the court cannot take notice of it, or the contrary view, that a corporation is composed of natural persons. Chief Justice Marshall decided in favor of the aggregate association view, writing that the mere legal entity cannot be a citizen or sue in federal court unless it be regarded as a company of individuals. And that is how the court regarded the bank. He wrote, the controversy is substantially between aliens suing by a corporate name and a citizen. In this case, the corporate name represents persons who are members of the corporation. This associative view also informed the court's logic in the early 20th century in Hale versus Henkel that, quote, a corporation is after all but an association of individuals. In organizing itself as a collective body, it waives no constitutional immunities appropriate to such body. Its property cannot be taken without compensation. It can only be proceeded against by due process of law and is protected under the 14th Amendment. And it seems as though this vision of a corporation animated the majority in Citizens United versus FEC, which held that the First Amendment prohibits Congress from fining or jailing as citizens or associations of citizens for simply engaging in political speech. And since corporations are properly conceptualized as associations of citizens that have taken on the corporate form, the First Amendment protects their speech. On the other end of the continuum, is the view that the corporation is an artificial entity separate from its constituents. Blackstone noted that in England, the king's consent is absolutely necessary to establish a corporation, and why? Well, it was because the king was consenting to what might be understood as limitations of liability through the fictional separation of the personhood of the corporation from its constituents. Here's Blackstone. The depths of a corporation, either to or from it, are totally extinguished by its dissolution so that the members thereof cannot recover or be charged with them in their natural capacities. And perhaps surprisingly, this view also has purchase in the views of Chief Justice Marshall, who wrote a decade after DeVoe in 1819 that a corporation is an artificial being existing only in contemplation of law. Being the mere creature of law, it possesses only those properties which the charter of its creation confers upon it. Later summarizing this view in dissent, Justice Brandeis wrote, that the corporate privilege was granted sparingly in the early republic and only when the grant seemed necessary in order to procure for the community some specific benefit otherwise unattainable. Moreover, he noted permission to incorporate for any lawful purpose was not common until 1875. And until that time, the duration of corporate franchises was generally limited to a period of 20, 30, or 50 years. This view supported also the doctrine of ultra viris which confined corporations to their chartered purpose. As a 1923 Law Review article put it, if the corporation enters into a transaction which is beyond the powers expressly or impliedly contained in its articles of incorporation, the transaction is said to be ultra viris, beyond the powers of a corporation. While the any lawful purpose charter resulted in a decline and in the enforcement of the ultra viris rule, some have suggested that it may see a comeback in the event that a corporation, say, acts for an unlawful purpose or commits illegal acts. On this theory of the corporation, it might seem, might be justified very disparate bodies of law addressing commercial speech, public accommodations, warning labels, labor law, common carriage, SEC disclosures, to name but a few. And on this entity vision, some have criticized Citizens United as bad corporate law. For example, Jonathan Macy and Leo Strine write, the Citizens United view of the corporation as an association of individuals is inconsistent with the conception of the corporation as a juridical entity with limited liability. The association theory, they continue, confuses the corporation with the general partnership form of business organization. In fact, the entire point of the incorporation process is to permit the creation of a legal entity that is not an association of individuals. Now, of course, both views of the corporation can stake historical and recent claims in the US reports. But the two views do seem logically opposed, unless some third term or criteria might be found to toggle between when corporations are associations clothed in their constituents' individual rights and when they are separate entities that may shoulder distinct rights and obligations. Now, while its implications are certainly still being digested since it was just handed down yesterday, the opinion in Mallory versus Norfolk Southern might suggest some fruitful inquiries. Of course, none of the opinions in that case explicitly question the idea that corporations have due process rights implicated by the assertion of personal jurisdiction, like natural individuals. But Justice Alito's concurrence did hint at distinctions between companies based on their size and sophistication. In his separate writing, he emphasized that, quote, large companies may be able to manage the patchwork of liability regimes, damages caps, and local rules in each state. But the impact on small companies, which constitute the majority of all US corporations, could be devastating. 
Large companies may resort to creative corporate structuring to limit their amenability to suit. Small companies may prudently choose not to enter an out-of-state market due to the increased risk. And while not a First Amendment case, Hobby Lobby stores also appeared to turn on distinctions not only in size but in corporate form. The court emphasized that the meaning of Congress's enactment in the Religious Freedom Restoration Act extended to closely held for-profit corporations and that Congress did not intend only among for-profits sole pri proprietorships or general partnerships to be protected. That was in part because the court concluded that, quote, modern corporate law does not require for-profit corporations to pursue profit at the expense of everything else, and also in part because it found that, quote, the idea that unrelated shareholders, including institutional investors with their own set of stakeholders, would agree to run a corporation under the same religious beliefs seems improbable, unquote. But what happens if that improbable idea in fact manifests itself? Or more plausibly, when such large entities with disparate rather than close ownership interests purport to speak with one voice for purposes of the First Amendment, perhaps scholars and jurists alike might seek arguments for a criteria to toggle between the association and entity views of the corporation in a given case. Or perhaps that is the task of my fellow panelists. Thank you to the Federal Society for organizing uh, this conference and to Judge Branch uh, for moderating for us. Um, I'm formally with, uh, with Alliance Defending Freedom, actually, and work with, uh, with Jim Campbell, so I'm glad to be able to, uh, uh, to be on the panel with him. And with that said, I'm perhaps in the odd position of being the strangest libertarian you've ever uh, seen on a panel like this uh, to represent uh, that view, uh, or at least something approaching libertarian ideas in this space. Um, it's not something that I thought, a position I thought I would be in just a few years ago. After all, the language of the last GOP platform from 2016, uh, the last existing one that the GOP had, uh, still commits the party to fighting against the Democrats who want to regulate the internet. Uh, but it does, I think, speak to the debates within the conservative and libertarian movement right now. So I'm just gonna offer a thumbnail sketch of my position, which is the First Amendment does broadly protect speech by corporations and organizations not just natural persons based on its text and our history and more so the case law interpreting the First Amendment. But moreover, I'll, I'll argue that attempts to weaken First Amendment rights um, of corporations and organizations would lead to bad outcomes that would be particularly problematic uh, for conservatives. So the First Amendment um, is a restriction on government. Uh, it only applies to government. It's not a free-floating, uh, protection of speech that commits the government to protecting a positive right to providing uh, free speech where uh, your ability to speak might run up against uh, the interests of someone else. It doesn't mention protecting only people. So many of the arguments against its application to corporations or organizations, in my view, seem to start at second base. Uh, the presumption that, well, uh, corporations aren't people, ergo. Uh, well, the First Amendment says nothing about protecting only uh, a person's ability to speak. It restricts government's ability to restrict speech. Some of the first settlers in America, of course, were the pilgrims. And the pilgrims came here to build a shining city on a hill, exercising their persecuted uh, religious faith and sharing that faith. But to the king and the shareholders back in England, the Massachusetts Bay Company was a commercial enterprise. And of course, uh, and they were here to make profits. And of course, uh, it was both at the same time. And that's not so different from the way that many corporations today uh, see, their, uh, see uh, what they do. Um, you can look at uh, Hobby Lobby, which uh, runs its stores. It also built the Museum of the Bible, um, Cookout and In-N-Out, which both include, include Bible verses on their cups. Um, and if we really wanted to spice this up, we could have a debate about regional burger chains and whether In-N-Out is overrated, which of course it is. Um, and of course, a few, that's probably going to be the most controversial thing I'll say today. Um, and of course, few argue that the press is not protected when it's a corporation like the New York Times or Fox News, um, or for that matter, that the First Amendment's religious exercise provisions apply only to individuals and not, for example, to the Catholic Church or the Little Sisters of the Poor or the Church of the Lakumi Babalu I, all of which are incorporated organizations. The typical historical argument against First Amendment rights for corporations comes from the left. Hobby Lobby, Conestoga Wood, um, Citizens United, um, where uh, the, the argument from the left was defending Hillary Clinton against the scourge of a critical movie. Um, and even in the religious liberty cases, some on the left have and continue to argue that the First Amendment really protects individual rights um, at least more than it does uh, corporate rights. And so therefore, if you are an individual 
um, who's, who has been dismissed or not hired by a religious organization um, because of your, uh, your beliefs, because your heterodox beliefs, um, that the law should actually be in support of the individual against the institutional uh, religious uh, organization. Conservatives for the last few decades have defended First Amendment freedoms regardless of institutional or corporate forms. For me and others, this has meant defending the First Amendment rights of student organizations, pro-life medical organizations, pregnancy centers, religious colleges, and religious and secular nonprofits, and for-profit businesses. If corporations lack free speech, then the rights, uh, free speech rights, then we need, to, I think, to be very clear about why and consider those consequences very carefully. Um, I'm going to uh, breeze through uh, some of the case law because I think that's been, uh, been handled well. Um, and because of the fact that the Supreme Court did not cooperate with today's panel and issue the 303 creative opinion, which would have <laughs> elucidated a lot. Um, so I could always just sort of provide the, the short circuit and say, um, I'm right, and tomorrow's 303 creative opinion will vindicate everything I say, but that would probably be cheating. Um, much of the conversation here is around compelled speech. Um, particularly the interests of conservatives, I think, around uh, corporate free speech rights is basically whether or not corporations can be compelled to say things um, or to carry messages. And so I'll focus there. With a handful of caveats, the Supreme Court has been really clear and strong in opposition to compelled speech, one of those caveats being Masterpiece Cake Shop, um, which hopefully will be uh, resolved tomorrow. Um, compelled speech is particularly noxious and uh, and wrong, whether it's the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Boy Scouts of America, a Boston Irish veterans organization, Elon Musk, or 303 Creative who are being compelled. But there are caveats uh, in Pruneyard uh, versus, uh, versus Robbins. It's often cited for the, the proposition that uh, government can compel people to facilitate private speech. Uh, if you actually read the opinion in Pruneyard, you'll come away quite disappointed, especially if you've read any other First Amendment case law um, since then, um, for just how little the court deals at all uh, with either the property rights interests or the free speech interests in that case. Uh, it sort of breezes right past them um, in that decision. But I think it's difficult to square Pruneyard, in my view, uh, with Hurley, uh, decided later unanimous decision from the Supreme Court, which among other things clarifies that the mere fact that someone does not uh, have a, an express position in opposition to the view that they would be required to communicate does not mean that you have no First Amendment right uh, uh, to, uh, to resist uh, using your voice for the ability to express that message. Uh, I'm certain that we will get into the common carrier conversation later, so I'll hold that um, for a bit and turn just briefly before I turn the, the microphone over to why conservatives should be uh, particularly concerned about this. Um, and why I think uh, we conservatives stand the most from attempts to restrict or compel speech from corporate entities. Um, it's noteworthy that in the net choice and uh, net choice cases challenging the Texas and Florida laws uh, and in 303 Creative, you see the same cases as the, the principal cases being cited by the, the plaintiffs in those cases. And that's because it's the same First Amendment interests that are ultimately at stake. Um, the same cases, uh, Hurley and Dale and others, are the ones that are relied upon both by people who are uh, the religious conservatives in 303 Creative and people who are uh, making the arguments in that choice. Indeed, the common carrier and adjacent arguments employed to defend speech regulations in the net choice cases are akin, in my mind, to those made by Colorado, arguing that the non-discrimination principles in that case justify compelled speech by a business. The common carrier argument, in my view, is not so different from the monopoly argument that Colorado would use. And in all these cases, the government seeks to defend its compelled speech by simply redefining uh, its compelled speech as compelling conduct. In Texas, the government argues that the Fifth Circuit and Fifth Circuit agreed that it's merely seeking to prohibit censorship, not to compel speech. In Colorado, the state argues it's simply forbidding discrimination, not compelling speech. And of course, in both cases, the government is simply applying a different label to the exact same reality. Conservatives should also be concerned about arguments that would compel some organizations or corporations to facilitate speech because there's no power to compel speech without the power to restrict speech. Compelled speech is ultimately just a content-based regulation of speech, and while some of my fellow conservatives are concerned about requiring corporations to permit speech, uh, I think the uh, 
many of the, the people on the other side of the aisle are concerned with the exact opposite possibility, uh, the ability to compel corporations to censor speech. And the power handed uh, to government to compel speech uh, can very easily, uh, because it's the flip side of the same coin, uh, be used for the opposite purpose. At the end of my remarks now, I'll just step back and, and ask broadly why. Um, I'm old enough to remember when uh, social conservatives, especially conservatives broadly, were most concerned about media bias. I'm still concerned about media bias. Um, and somehow we have shifted this conversation to social media bias recently and forgotten uh, media bias. Why is that? The reason I think that we are no longer focused on media bias and instead talking about social media bias is because media bias doesn't matter anymore. And the reason media bias doesn't matter anymore is because of social media. Social media has provided an outlet for conservatives to be able to express views that has simply robbed the, the old gatekeepers of their ability to gatekeep. That doesn't mean there are no more gatekeepers. It doesn't mean that there are not problems to deal with in the social media context. What it does mean is that a lot more keys have been made available to conservatives to get their, their ideas out, to express themselves that we did not have under the, uh, the prior framework. And I think there is a, a great risk that in attempting to solve one problem that you actually send us back to a world in which the Washington Post editorial board gets to decide which ideas um, are actually able to be expressed uh, to the world. And I'll stop there. Professor. Well, thank you, Judge. Branch and uh, thanks to the Federalist Society and uh, particularly, uh, particularly um, Alita Cass, who's done so much for you know, bringing um, energy and um, light into some of the most interesting questions that um, are facing uh, conservative and libertarian movements today. So, as was ably brought out by the other panelists. Um, Corporate speech stands in a certain limbo. Sometimes we think of corporations as separate entities, sometimes separate entities that don't really have full juridical rights. Other times there are aggregations of people which, and, and the rights that inherit in individuals flow naturally to the corporations. Um, and the case law is, is simply not clear. And it really uh, it presents more questions than it answers. Yes, when engaged directly in political speech, like a campaign contribution, um, corporations are protected by the First Amendment, but broadcasters aren't protected on the First Amendment from saying you know, bad words on um, certain most of hours of broadcast. Um, broadcasters are required to carry uh, political speech, whether they like it or not. Um, commercial speech is a special category for First Amendment protection, and corporations generally engage in commercial speech. Um, and professional speech is considered actions, not speech, and so can be very heavily regulated uh, by the states. Uh, so we don't really, the case law simply doesn't provide um, clear lines. Um, well, so, you know, law professor, well, what do you do? You know, you go back to uh, the, the First Amendment and, the, and, uh, and well, what does it say? That's the first thing, the textualist approach. And uh, as Casey pointed out, it doesn't distinguish between um, uh, corporations or individuals, as Congress shall pass, um, sh shall make, <laughs> I always have to write it down in case I misquote it, it's very embarrassing for me. Uh, con Congress shall make no law um, respecting dot, 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 the freedom of speech or the press. Um, but of course, the text of the First Amendment is not a particularly good guide. Um, it's talking to a constitution before incorporation. Um, and of course, and uh, at the time of the, um, uh, well, libel law, trade secrets law, um, threats, I mean, literally would be prohibited under a literal reading of the First Amendment. So the text is always not always is particularly helpful. So let's go to the originalist approach. What did the founders say about the First Amendment? Did they say anything about corporations? Well, they didn't say very much about the First Amendment, um, but they did say one thing, one thing that is particularly relevant to this conversation. And if you would ask, I think this is a fair argument, although if there are any historians here, they can jump up and tell me I'm, I'm full of it. Um, one thing that was freedom of speech to the founding generation was protection from printing press licensing. That was the main concern that the founders, to the degree they expressed concerns about freedom of press, were particularly concerned about. That's what John Milton wrote in Aria Pagata. It was that there weren't that many um, uh, printing presses in England um, in the 17th century, and the government, had, the crown, had a very restrictive licensing regime, um, and they were able to censor. Um, they were able to use their friends in sort of 
the religious, nonprofit, and academic worlds to censor. Um, la plus ça change, la plus ça même ça. Um, and that was an indirect, subtle way of eliminating speech critical to the crown. Um, and that is particularly um, relevant today um, in, this, in the face of the administrative state. I mean, what is the administrative state but an enormous licensing scheme which government is able to use to control behavior, including that of the press? And before you all think that sounds an insane, uh, you know, paranoid conservative view, I, I submit to evidence the Twitter files. Um, and so that what we see is that laws like the Florida law, like the Texas law, that regulate private entities are, um, are really protecting individuals from the state. Because when those private entities can be so easily co-opted by the state, as with the private presses in the 17th century, as with Twitter in the 21st, then these laws are protecting individuals from the government. Um, they are not, you know, I'm here from the government and I'm, and I'm here to help. Um, so I think from an originalist perspective, a very good argument can be made to protect, that, that um, the social media and discrimination laws are, which are restrictions on government, but are very consistent with what the, the framers would have found to be appropriate. Okay, let's jump even further into the world of abstraction. You know, what is the purpose? What are the ends and, and you know, I guess I'm a law professor, I should say, normative goals of the First Amendment? Uh, well, you know, you, the typical ones you usually get, the sort of John Mickelson, um promote democratic discourse. And I think that's right. Um, and it's discourse of individuals as well as individuals organizing into groups. And I think that would make a very good argument that corporations should be protected because we participate in politics, not just as individuals, but also as groups. On the other hand, um, as the lunch panelists talk, spoke about, um, when we give corporations unfettered or complete First Amendment rights, who in reality are we empowering? Um, uh, John Burnham, I guess both of them, um, suggested it was the managerial classes. It, it's essentially Larry Fink and his friends at the Aspen Institute and Davos, a very small minority. Does that further the sort of democratic discourse that Michael John was talking about? I don't know, but I think that's one of the questions the precedents um, uh, um, leave open. Uh, another purpose of the, of, of, of the First Amendment, it was pointed out by um, uh, Elliot, self-expression, creative dignity. Um, again, we usually associate that with individuals. I mean, individuals use the First Amendment to express themselves and their ideas. In addition, sometimes corporations do, and they will often say that they're, you know, they're adopting this ESG program, um, they're adopting this political view for marketing purposes. Um, that's a real thing, I suppose. Um, is it a good thing? I don't know. Um, you know we talk about our polarized society. Um, do we want every aspect of our lives, including our commercial lives, to somehow respect, uh, reflect a political viewpoint? Um, I'm reminded once, the story my father always tells me, he was in the Netherlands and he wanted to buy tobacco for his pipe, and he asked a friend, where should I go? And the friend said, well, are you Catholic or are you Protestant? <laughs> and um, that's not what I think society, our society should be about. Um, finally, um, you know, we have the First Amendment to help people monitor government, so people can speak up and say, this is wrong, you corrupt evil politician. Well, we tried that in the 2020 election, but Twitter didn't let the New York Post do that, did it? These are realities. These are perversions of our democracy that have been that have been executed by the large social media companies. They're, not, they're beyond theory, they're fact. And not to say that we can't, on, on these abstract notions, respond to that as a democracy, I think um, is really being ostrich-like. Um, finally, uh, and I think this is really the most important you know, philosophy aside, this is the most important issue, which is you know, what is corporate speech? Um, and uh, this really pegs back to um, the first discussion. Um, corporations will want to say everything they do is expressive. Um, you know, and that's a very dangerous line to go through because you know, the, the, the social media companies will say, well, when I censor speech of other people, I'm expressing something. Well, they're not really expressing, they're not speaking, 
They're acting. They are performing acts on other people's speech. Um, and when we do that, well, the, the, the principles of um, you know, Texas v. Johnson and expressive action come to play. Um, and there are really high rules about that. There has to be a, a, a clear and particularized message, and it has to be intended to be expressed, and there has to be an audience that will reasonably understand it. Otherwise, every action people do, or corporations do, is speech. So the lunch counter in the South that wants to prohibit you know, black people or Presbyterians or whomever from their lunch counters in order to express their, their, you know, their, their preference for white people or their you know, dislike of Presbyterianism, um, that's expressive, that's an action. They're just editing their corporation to promote and communicate a message. And that can't be. There has to be a distinction between actions and speech, because otherwise everything will become speech. Um, and uh, you know, I think that's a that, that's a real danger. Last point. Um, a while back, when you know, decisions, um, Justice Kennedy decisions. He's, he's taking a beating today. Um, like Sorrell were coming out. Um, there was this notion of. Um, uh, First Amendment uh, Lochnerism. You know, it's like, oh, we're somehow making expressive actions immune from all regulation. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's a bad idea. I mean, I'm not that opposed to Lochnerism. I, but, uh, uh, but what I am opposed to is Dirigism. Because what is happening is that the most powerful corporations that can exert the greatest amount of political power and and have um, directly influenced the political process, use the First Amendment to escape all regulation. Well, you know, other, the other poor people in you know, oil or banking or whatever, well, you know, they just get stuck with the Commerce Clause and, um, you know, too bad for them. Uh, and I think that's a real problem um, and, and because what we're really talking about is a program of selective deregulation and that has big systemic impact. I'm done. Thanks. All right, um, I'd like to address three things today. Uh, first, I'll start with talking about one reason in particular why free speech rights for corporations are important. Second point is whether there should be a difference in the free speech protection given to different kinds of corporation. And then the last point, if I have time, is to discuss what, if anything, can be done about a problem that we're seeing a lot, which we refer to as debanking. And that is, um, most of you are probably familiar with it, large banks refusing to deal with people because of the speech or goals that they're engaged in. So to start with the first issue, there are many reasons why it's important to ensure that free speech rights apply to corporations. And the one I'd like to highlight in particular are it protects the rights of the real people who own and operate these entities. And, and I think this goes back to the original dichotomy uh, that was set up by Elliot, uh, talking about an aggregate of individuals. So this would be focusing more on that theory. Uh, I'll start with what Justice Alito recognized in his Hobby Lobby decision, which of course Hobby Lobby is a RIFRA case. But I think what he recognized is this close connection between the rights of the corporation and they're in, the fact that they're intertwined with the rights of the individuals that own and operate it. And I think the same is true for speech as well, particularly when we're dealing with the closely held corporations. Now, we at Alliance Defending Freedom, which is the group that I work for and litigate on behalf of, uh, we deal in this space a lot where we defend corporations who are fighting for their free speech rights. In fact, Casey alluded to it, mentioned it a couple times, we're waiting for a decision from the U.S. Supreme Court right now in the 303 Creative case. In 303 Creative, the question is whether the state of Colorado can use a public accommodation law to force a graphic designer to create messages that conflict with her conscience and her, her beliefs. The lead client in that case, it's called 303 Creative. That's not the name of an indiv individual. Maybe people in Hollywood give names like that, but that is the name of a for-profit business entity. And so that case squarely presents questions of what kind of free speech protection is available for corporations. And the reality is, is that if they don't have corporates, if corporations don't have speech protections, then the people who operate them, so in the 303 Creative case, Lori Smith, the owner and operator, would not have the free speech rights in the marketplace, and she would be forced to express views that violate her beliefs. 
Now, why does this matter? Why does it matter that people are, are free to speak consistent with their conscience, whether that's to speak freely or to refrain from speaking when they're asked to say something they don't believe? It matters for a number of reasons, but I'll highlight two that the Supreme Court has talked about. The first is, in cases like Woolley versus Maynard, the Supreme Court has talked about the individual freedom of mind. And so this ensures that individuals are free to live consistently with what they believe in their mind, and they're not, and they're not forced to act and speak inconsistently with what they believe. The second reason is, was explained by the Supreme Court more recently in the Janus decision back in 2018. And there, Justice Alito wrote that forcing individuals to endorse ideas they find objectionable is always demeaning. And so again, if we don't have free speech protection for corporations, then the people who own and operate them are forced into those violations of conscience. So that brings me to the second issue, which is should there be different protections for different kinds of corporations? I think under existing precedent, the short answer to that question is that generally all corporations, whether it's nonprofit or for-profit, whether it's closely held or publicly traded, are entitled to a measure of free speech protection. So the seminal case, which maybe all of us have mentioned this morning, of course, is Citizens United, or this afternoon, is Citizens United. Uh, Citizens United dealt with a penalty on speech, so it was an attempt to indirectly silence speech. That case only um, dealt, at least the facts, only dealt with a nonprofit entity, but the court's analysis uh, definitely went more broadly than that. So I think Citizens United establishes that whether you're for profit or nonprofit, the corporation has speech rights. And then turn from the concept of silencing speech to the concept of compelling speech. And the Supreme Court has been very clear there that for profit entities, including publicly traded corporations have those rights as well. Um, I'll point out two cases. One is the uh, Pacific Gas and Electric case, and another is the Riley case, Riley versus um, the Federation of the Blind of North Carolina. So in the Pacific Gas and Electric case, PG&E is in fact a publicly traded corporation. It was forced by the state of California to include in its materials, in its billing envelope, um, a newsletter that had messages it didn't want to support and it didn't want to spread. And the Supreme Court said that that would violate its speech rights to include that in the billing envelope. And so I think that that is a key precedent that establishes um, very important, robust protection for corporate speech. And then in the Riley case I mentioned, the court held that the state of North Carolina there could not force professional fundraisers to disclose information about its fees to potential donors that they were seeking to raise funds from. Again, another case, for-profit entities where it was very clear that compelled speech protection existed. So what do we make of the publicly traded corporation? I think that seems to be the, the rub here. You know, what, what do we do? I think under existing precedent, as I said, they are entitled to speech protection. The real difference with the publicly traded corporation is who is the one who's selecting the speech. And that's the problem that we talked about over the lunch hour. It's a problem that's been hit on previously today. And I think under current law, the primary speaker is management. Um, certainly there are ways that shareholders can get their voice uh, directly in there through shareholder resolutions and other um, corporate procedures, but primarily speaking, uh, the person that we're dealing with or the speaker at issue when we have one of these publicly traded corporations is management. And so what does that mean? Uh, what, what, what can we take from that? Um, practically speaking, I think we've seen that through large asset managers like BlackRock and Vanguard, again, uh, topics that were discussed during the lunch hour, that most of the corporate speech and the corporate speech interest is left-leaning. So that puts um, people in a situation where we have to determine, um, is there anything that the state can do about it or the federal government can do about it? Uh, one of the concerns that we have, and this brings me to my last topic, is the issue of debanking. Um, debanking, 
we've seen, uh, we have a, a, a spreadsheet in our office where we keep track of all of these instances where uh, somebody is simply trying to open a bank account or recently opened a bank account and they're having their bank account uh, taken away and oftentimes they're not getting an explanation or they're getting a demand to disclose information such as um, what types of donors do they have, what types of political candidates do they support. And uh, the question then arises, again, can the state do something about it, or do corporate speech rights or other corporate rights prevent the states from acting? And I don't believe it does, because when uh, a corporation allows a customer to open a bank account, it is not engaging in speech. Um, and I think this, this is something that was alluded to earlier. It's not everything that a corporation does is speech. Speech, the courts have been dealing with this for decades. Speech is something that courts understand. Courts know how to recognize it, and it doesn't include everything. So because something like opening a bank account or, ho or hosting some, uh, some group or some individual's bank account is not speech, there shouldn't be any sort of First Amendment bar for states uh, dealing with this issue of debanking. So um, we are working on model legislation to, to help address this issue. We hope to, to be active in it in the future, but we see this as a very uh, important problem that is manifesting out of corporate America, and it's something that I think the states do have power to address. So I'll, I'll end with that. Uh, thank you to the panelists. And I wanted to let anybody uh, who would like to respond to anything that one of your fe fellow panelists said, please uh, feel free. Well, thank you, Judge, and thank you, everybody. Uh, great comments. One thing that has been a theoretical distinction that I think is a little bit worth pressing on, it was addressed in one of those parts of the reasoning in the Hobby Lobby case, where the majority of the court said that not everything that a corporation does is in the relentless pursuit of profit. And of course, we've seen the rise of what is known as stakeholder capitalism and other concepts of that nature. Now, of course, in the precedence of the court, we've had a long distinction between uh, common sense differences between speech that proposes a commercial transaction or commercial speech and other varieties of speech. I don't know what it is about the state of Ohio, my home state, but the two leading cases on that, Zouderer and Oreck, are both out of my home state. And they talk about how if you are dealing with commercial speech, uh, the state can impose restrictions that it could not otherwise impose, and its restrictions are subject to intermediate rather than strict scrutiny. We've largely been talking about political speech, which of course is different because it gives uh, the protection to that speech of the highest nature. So my question, I think, though, I would love the thoughts of my scholarly fellow panelists, is whether or not it is correct that when a corporate manager, especially in a widely held corporation uh, of the publicly traded nature, whether they can actually be engaged in non-commercial speech. Uh, in the strictest sense, they're not proposing a transaction, but they're adopting their political view in part because their investors want them to, or in part because they think that it will market well to the next generation, millennials or Gen Z, or maybe it's because they think that uh, their investors or their customer base will prefer it in the long run, or, or that'll help them to avoid some kind of legal liability on one side versus another. There's still some sort of pecuniary interest involved in the management's choice of what it is that it's speaking. And so should there be a distinction between uh, political speech by corporations and commercial speech by corporations, or is all corporate speech effectively commercial speech? I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, I think that that is under the court, Kurt's, court's current understanding of commercial speech. It is confined to proposing a commercial transaction. So I, I don't think it would be a proper reading of the court's current jurisprudence to say that everything a corporation says is necessarily commercial speech. I think that would conflict with Zotterer. Uh, mo more recently in the NIFLA case that Judge Branch referred to at the outset, uh, the court dealt with uh, the Zotterer Doctrine and continued to reinforce the fact that it, it is a narrow, narrow principle that applies only to proposing a commercial transaction. So that, that would be my response. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I agree with that sentiment, um, you know, because the motivations of corporations and individuals are different. Um, but uh, I, particularly after um, Citizens United, um, there is this notion of corporate political speech that the court will recognize. Do you have any? I, I'll, I'll just say, I mean, the, the, the place where I've dealt with, uh, with Zotter is the attempted expansion of commercial speech um, 
this is basically an argument from the left, uh, from uh, Professor Chemerinsky, arguing that uh, anything is commercial speech if, it's, uh, if it includes commercial value. So the argument came up in the context of pregnancy centers, regulation of uh, the speech rights of pregnancy centers. And the argument was, well, yes, these are nonprofits, but um, they are providing free diapers, and diapers have economic value. And so therefore, the provision of free diapers is something that the government can regulate uh, as commercial speech. Um, I hope that sounds crazy to everyone in this room. It's been rejected uh, by the courts. But I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's important to sort of see where these, uh, like, what are the arguments that the left is making um, along these same lines? How can this argument that is um, being dangled be used in a way that is uh, obviously contrary to the goal that you're, you're attempting to achieve. And obviously, I would imagine the 303 creative context too. It's part of the, part of the argument that you, you face is basically, um, look, Lori Smith, um, you know, should uh, shut up and create websites, right? Kind of the, the flip of the, the characterization of the conservative argument, you know, the uh, shut up and play basketball. Um, it's basically like just focus on uh, on you know doing your business. No one wants to hear your opinions. I think the reality is you know as I, I mentioned, I mean, if you go all the way back to the Pilgrims, people have always both uh, done their business, um, tried to make a profit, and at the same time uh, been citizens who had opinions. Um, and uh, I, I I don't want a world where we sort of bifurcate that and you're. You're sort of only able to uh, uh, to speak. I, I acknowledge that there are major problems, and especially given the current status of you know the the way these the balance of opinions, right? Um, but I think that would be uh, the medicine would be too strong. Do either of you have any comments on anything the other panelists have said? I, I will just just say I mean a point of agreement. Um, uh, with Professor Kandu, uh, that the Where administra- that we found one. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, the, I will fully agree that the administrative state is a massive licensing scheme. <laughs> uh, my solution for that um, would be to end the administrative state, though. Um, so, I, you know, I think, I mean, my, my thought well, process is. Right. Again, we agree, but. That's yeah. right, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, it's basically, look, the, the fact that we have uh, decided for the last, you know, 150 years or so, 120 years or so, uh, to not actually uh, pay attention to Article One and Article Two isn't, to me, a good reason to uh, start flexing on the First Amendment. Also, um, I think we should just go back and fix what we've been doing on the on the first two articles. Any comments from either of you? On I, the I don't think it's a point of disagreement. Just to highlight something, uh, one point that Casey made is that in the context of he. he noted the observation that in 303 Creative, a lot of the arguments that, that are made on the side of the government are similar to the arguments that are made of the folks um, in the, the net choice case. And, and I, th I just wanted to point out my view that I think that there can be daylight between those two. I don't, I don't think if you find um, for the government in 303 Creative that that necessarily means that you have to find against the uh, social media companies in in that choice. I think that there is th so the way that I view the case precedent, and I think this is what the Fifth Circuit said in in uh, in the decision in, in the Texas case, is that the key is whether in compelling someone to host someone else's message, are you in effect uh, having some kind of an impact on the speaker's own message? So in that to to put facts on it in that case. If you're dealing with the social media companies and you're forcing them to host someone else's speech, the key question is, is, is that affecting their own speech? And I think you could say that it's not affecting the social media company's speech, but on the flip side in the 303 Creative case, I don't think you can come to the conclusion that it's not affecting the business owner's speech there because it's actually forcing her to create speech with messages that she considers objectionable. So I'm not saying that's necessarily the right outcome. I think that's one of the reasons why those, those cases are so tricky is that uh, there are close, close lines and the courts have to make difficult judgment calls. But I don't think that they're irreconcilable. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. So I, I, I will agree with that and just say, I, I think it, I agree that while, while I, I think that the, the rights 
are and should be more closely connected. I, it's easy for me to imagine um, the court siding with uh, 303 Creative and that not foreclosing, certainly. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I fully expect the, the net choice cases are going to come next year, and they're not going to, uh, you know, GVR in light of 303 Creative. I think there will still be some open questions. I think it should advance the ball in helping to answer those questions. Um, on the flip side, and I, I argued this back in, in real clear back in the fall, um, basically Elon Musk and, and Mark Zuckerberg should have filed briefs in 303 Creative because I don't, it's difficult, much more difficult for me to see how it is that uh, their First Amendment rights are protected and Lori Smith's is not. Um, I think if, if Colorado can force a, uh, a website designer to create websites that she does not want to create, it's difficult for me to see why it is that Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk uh, have a right to uh, refuse to allow people uh, to tweet uh, or post messages on their websites. I'll, 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 I'll you, you got me, um, Casey. So um, I, 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 that's a real difference. I mean, it's not just daylight. I mean, they're just very different things. Um, a website is as um, is a particularized message, as the Supreme Court would say, or a coherent speech product, as uh, Eugene Volokh would say, and as I noticed that word got around, that you can look at one place and one time, and it has a meaning. Um, what I found most interesting about yes, uh, this morning's conversation was that somehow this whole disaggregate social media that we only see a tiny, you know, one billionth of what's out there, somehow expresses a point of view. It, it, it communicates an idea. Um, that's what the First Amendment is about. I mean, I think we can all agree, textualists, um, uh, originalists, is that it protects, it protects the expression of an idea. Um, and it does not create, it does not protect scattered little actions that no one can possibly put together and understand as a message. And that's why the Supreme Court, in the fair, in, in the fair case, um, Fair v. Rumsfeld said, look, you know, discriminatory uh, access to university recruiting is not expressive because no one is there, sort of the panopticon, seeing all of the recruiters going on and off campus and is able to conclude a coherent message from it. Similarly with social media, what do you see? You see little slivers of, of, of what exists, and somehow you're supposed to infer from the little slivers of what, you, what exists a coherent message worthy of First Amendment protection. Um, the absurdity of that position was really found in the 11th Circuit. I, oh God, poor Judge Newsom, but um, uh, <laughs> it, it, when he was dealing with the question of shadow banning, which of course, as you know, is when court, when um, uh, social media will, unbeknownst to both to users and to, to the user and to the people following them, uh, uh, will not make their, their tweets or their posts visible. Um, how does that get First Amendment expression? Nobody sees it. Um, and uh, it's invisible. It expresses nothing. It's not intended to express anything. Um, so that, you know, I, I, th th there's not just daylight between these two cases. I mean, it's, it's day and night. Um, and uh, I you know, look forward to seeing how that works out next year. And at the risk, of, I have one question that I, I realize flies in the face of, a, of, of some of the things that that at least two of you have expressed today about your desire to abolish the administrative state. So <laughs> with, with that in mind, my question would be, we've, you've discussed objectionable speech or actions uh, on, uh, on the behalf of corporations, debanking, you've, we've talked about ESG <laughs> policies, we've talked about, uh, Mr. Campbell, you talk about drafting legislation for states. What role, if any, some of these are you know, regulated by the federal government. You have the SEC, um, you know, certainly banks are regulated. What role does the federal government potentially play in affecting corporate speech and how does that work with, this, with the efforts of the states? Yeah, I, I, think that's a, I think that's a good question. So the first thing that comes to mind, specifically in the ESG space, is what we're seeing with um, the fiduciary duty standard that ERISA sets. And so this is maybe a little bit out, out in left field, but I think it's relevant. So ERISA sets a standard that it's a fiduciary duty standard for everyone who's managing money that is somehow falls under ERISA regulation. And there's a question whether that should be interpreted as the sole 
interest, the sole financial interest standard, or whether it should be a broader standard. And the Trump administration construed it to be uh, a sole financial interest, which means that the money manager needs to focus simply on maximizing profit. On the flip side, when the Biden administration came in, it reinterpreted that to be a broader standard to allow the money manager to consider not only maximizing profits, but also maximizing these other stakeholder interests. And so I think that's an, in, that's a, a, an example of where by broadening out the considerations that these money managers, which are obviously large corporations, can take into account, I think that that impacts uh, the way that they can use ESG in a way that, that touches on speech. So I, I absolutely think that the federal government has a role to play. Now, where it, where it comes into play with the debanking uh, in, in particular, um, I think that's, that's part of the consideration uh, in terms of crafting a bill that, on the state level where we make sure that it's not preempted on the, on the federal level. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the whole ESG point goes to, to the last issue I was talking about where the line between corporate action and corporate speech. And of course, everything corp corporations do, they now will say is actually their expressive action. And then you get to the situation where you have with ESG. It's like, well, I have a right to political speech. Everything I do is political speech, and I being, if I were a corporation. Um, so therefore, it's protected. And um, I'm reminded of a very famous essay by Milton Friedman. And I'm, I'm supposed to be on the, you know, the, the populist wing of the Republican Party. I'm not supposed to cite the libertarian. But I think he would be on my side on this. And he wrote a very famous essay um, on whether or not corporations should make charitable contributions. And he said, no, they shouldn't. And you know, the reason was um, that corporations have a job to do, and that's maximizing profits. Government has a job to do, and that's creating a better society. Civil organizations do, religions do. Um, and there is a problem when everyone gets in each other's lane. Um, you know, we expect corporate, you know, people who manage corporations are trained to be good at accounting and risk management. Um, they're not trained to be good at global warming forecasting or determining, you know, what is the appropriate way, what, what are appropriate pronouns. Um, we, that should be done by other sides, of, uh, other parts of society, and there's a loss um, when we essentially um, allow corporations to say everything they do is expressive because I mean, people should stick in their own lane. I'm getting ready to open this up for audience Q&A, so you will see the two microphones there, and I'll just alternate back and forth. If you would just say your name before sure. you ask the question. You, Thanks. Uh, Chris Newman, Scalia Law. Um, it's long struck me that perhaps the whole argument over whether corporations are people or corporations have First Amendment rights in their own name is sort of a red herring. I mean, obviously all speech is by individuals or associations of individuals, and the question is whether a corp the corporate form of organization is a tool, a tool just like, you know, using television waves or printing presses or whatever. And so the question is whether regulating this particular form of conduct has the sort of impact on speech that we think violates people's rights to speech. And then it occurs to me, well, the corporate form of organization isn't a natural right. It's an artificial creation of government with a limited liability and various things for various purposes. And so I wonder, even under Citizens United, what would prevent a state, if it had the political will to do so, to say, well, look, instead of just a general incorporation statute, which doesn't have to exist, we can actually legislate what our lunchtime speaker wanted or what um, Jonathan in the earlier panel wanted and say, look, um, if you want to incorporate under our state as a for-profit entity, you're only allowed to use your corporate form of organization for strictly business-related speech. And I'm not even sure that how you would analyze that under Citizens United. It's not clear to me that that would run afoul of that. I'm just wondering what you all think of that. So I, I think um, the, the first thing that would come to my mind on, uh, on that hypo, I think, is, uh, is basically an unconstitutional condition question, right? So it, even if you don't have, um, even if the, the corporate form is a, a privilege that government can provide, um, you'd still have the question whether the government can say, we have a privilege we would like to provide. Anyone who would like to access this privilege needs to, uh, you know, effectively metaphorically 
sign the form waiving certain constitutional rights, and then we will provide you a benefit, right? Uh, and there are a number of Supreme Court cases that, that speak to that. Uh, that's, uh, that's not to say that there may be you know, something that, uh, that corporate law could, could do in that space, but sort of on the, the broad, you know, could you just say, uh, well, if you receive the corporate form, then these are the rights you waive, probably not. Um, Actually, I'm finding myself agreeing with, with Casey yet again. I mean, it, it, it would, it, the question is, would it be an unconstitutional condition? Um, you know, Philip Hamburger has written a wonderful book about the problems of the doctrine. Um, I just read it and my, my brain is still spinning. So I don't, I, other than just say it's, it's, it's a hard question. It was just not much of an answer, so sorry. You in the back? Yes, uh, Noah Peters, Brewer Attorneys. Um, and I, I've worked on these issues with, with uh, Adam before. Um, and great panel, by the way. Um, and I, I want to propose, maybe in the spirit of the Counterman decision, which came out yesterday, which uh, was a, a little bit of a compromise decision, borrowing from other areas of law um, in the area of the First Amendment. Let me propose maybe something that could get all of the panel on board. So let's analogize the issue of uh, huge companies, you know, uh, social media companies, attempting to you know, uh, curate or censor, however you want to say it. Let's analogize it to the government speech doctrine, right? We say that the government has free speech rights, but we're very, very wary of, of that, and we want to uh, kind of cabinet within limits. So we recognize you know, uh, Sons of Confederate Veterans versus Walker as being at the very outer limit of government speech, where we say a license plate is a traditional forum for state speech, so even though in this case there is some denial of choice by of, on individuals. We say that's a uh, government speech, but that's the line. And maybe we even bring in Pruneyard, and we say we've considered in Pruneyard um, a regulation, you know, that that is somewhat similar to maybe Texas's, right? Um, and we consider the First Amendment implications, and we say there really isn't any interference with, um, you know, the shopping mall owner's ability to project a message. And we come out on the side of upholding the Texas law, which is, you know, <laughs> what we would like. Um, does, that, does that sound good to everyone, or am I I'm off base with that? I mean, one thought that I would have about the government speech doctrine, to begin, I don't think that the government speech doctrine says that governments have themselves First Amendment rights, simply that when the government is speaking, it is allowed to choose a perspective without running afoul of the viewpoint neutrality requirements implicit in the First Amendment. And so I do think government speech plays a critical role in the ecosystem of self-government, in part because we've talked a lot in this conference today about how so many people feel disenfranchised and shut out of many of the old and powerful institutions of our country, corporate America, the media, social media companies, tech, and one of the last places where ordinary Joe might be able to actually influence the speech of a large institution is by electing people who agree with his perspective and who are willing to say it um, and willing to say, you know, uh, when the government is speaking, the government isn't going to endorse certain messages. Um, so I think there's a lot of profitability in thinking about that. I agree uh, with my panelists about the dearth of analysis in Pruneyard, and I look forward to an exposition of if that is still good law, uh, what its actual outer limits happen to be. I remember as a 1L when I read that, I thought, well, my goodness, I would hate it if somebody could use my private property uh, to disseminate a message that I found distasteful um, just on property rights grounds. Anyone else? Well, of course I like the idea, Noah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there is actually um, an area, I, I think it may come up um, this year, about cases involving license plates and also um, government displays with speeches, with um, um, flags and statutes, um, where the court had to distinguish between the speech of the government and the speech of individuals. Um, and I think that there's a lot there that hasn't been in the briefing. Maybe we'll see it in, in the briefing um, coming up. But for instance, in the license plate case is a wonderful issue. Um, you get to choose the little tag, you know, you know, live free or die. What is that, New Hampshire? Is it, yeah. Um, uh, you get to choose as an individual, is that your speech or is that government speech? And, and the cases come out, it's actually government speech because they control it, they, you know, they have complete editorial discretions put it in or not. Um, however, the courts have gone the other way when issues of like 
public displays of statuary where they say anyone can come to the, this park and put a statue up. And that seems to me like a social media um, type thing. So I think there's a tremendous an analogy in court in a lot of those cases and I think that you know, maybe, maybe they'll, they'll be useful to the court. I'll speak to, to just I mean, one point on, on the social media point that I, I failed to mention earlier, and this is more a uh, consequentialist argument than it is a, uh, a legal point. But I think one of the, one of the other things that uh, in the, the social media context that, um, that I see with these debates is sort of an assumption of, uh, of uh, that the platforms remain static. If you change this, the platform nevertheless remains static. Uh, and I, I think that's a, a flawed reasoning. What I mean by that is this. Uh, there's a, a tendency to think what I want on, particularly from the right, what I want on social media platforms is more free speech. I want them to censor less. I want more free speech. What I actually want is I want, I want an audience for the ideas that, that I want to communicate. And I think we at least have to grapple with the reality that if I, if I achieve what I want and they are forced to allow me they're not allowed to censor. They're allowed. Uh, I'm allowed to say what I want, and they can't do anything about it. That I I get what I want, and then find that it's not in fact what I was after. Um, that the the consequences now I have uh, because of their inability to uh, to restrict content. That the people that I actually want to talk to. I, I went back and forth with a lefty law professor yesterday on Twitter. That's to me the value of Twitter is being able to. Uh, a, explain to a lefty law professor why he's wrong. Maybe I'm completely wasting my time. But um, that's the value to me, not having a shared conversation with a bunch of people who already agree with me. I can do that on a lot of other platforms. Um, so if, I, if Twitter is, uh, is in the position where it has to allow content that basically push those people off the platform, I can say that those people are wrong and they shouldn't leave. Um, but what does that gain me? Um, if they're no longer there, um, because they, you know, it's, it's a common carrier or whatever. If they, in fact, have to actually allow all the content and people decide, well, then I'm, I'm off the platform, I have what I want and I don't, I find no value in the platform anymore. Um, and I think that's, that's something that is often missing from this conversation uh, in my mind. Uh, yes, sir. J.P. Hogan. I guess I'll go towards the administrative state. Um, being a separation issue, they, they lean on trying to have a secular socialism footing as if it's equal to religious liberty, which they're using like a wall of separation instead of vertical separation of the government also under God. So with Disney and Citizens United, is there a difference where Disney's speech is actually trying to have an evolved religious interpretation while they're not licensed to be religious, that they want to then operate even though it would be more secular socialism, they're trying to have an evolved uh, change in definitions. And they're being fought not for saying something about religious liberty and freedom for all, but for how they can operate differently. And I'll try to lead up, but that also brings on naturalism then, under, religious, under originalism being your rights come from your creator, everyone should fight with the, struggle with the concept of creator, Cre uh, the create case, would be if someone is in, in naturalism and secular, they're actually outside everyone is supposed to struggle with dealing with the concept of creator. So there's, where, where are the boxes? Where can you separate some of that mm -hmm. stuff? Well, if the question is that, it, can the government favor non-religion over religion? Well, that has certainly been answered many times over by the Supreme Court's precedents. And most recently in Carson versus Macon, the Chief Justice's opinion made clear that uh, if a state sets up a program and says anybody can participate except the religious, that itself is a First Amendment violation. I'm not totally sure I follow the rest of the question, but as far as that principle, it, it is deeply embedded in our law. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, I'm Andrea Lucas. I'm a commissioner on the EEOC, and um, I was interested in the panel's perspective on how criticisms of the Stop Woke Act in Florida uh, under as a First Amendment violation intersect with the idea that Title VII already regulates much of the conduct, in my opinion, covered by the Stop Woke Act. So the Stop Woke Act is focused on preventing employers from engaging in racially harassing and hostile work environments. Title VII does the same thing. In my mind, it seems like they either rise or fall on the, on the same ground. So wh whether you think the Stop Woke Act 
violates the First Amendment? Um, do you think that there are pro Title VII similar problems? Or if you find uh, the Stop Woke Act uh, legally defensible under the First Amendment, then what do you think about how that intersects with Title VII? So I'll, I'll just say I think the uh, the, the challenge with um, well it's, I mean, first of all I have no problem with belt and suspenders approaches right so the mere fact that, that federal law prohibits something sure. um, doesn't mean that the that the states can't uh, can't also deal with it I, I think honestly the the problem with uh, with laws like the the Stop Woke Act and and others I and mean, the First Amendment is uh, is unforgiving um, in the sense that um, a law can be largely compliant with the First Amendment, and there can be aspects that are, or applications that are not compliant. Um, I, I think particularly when, you know, on issues like uh, application to, uh, to universities, that context is, I think, a particularly challenging example. Um, uh, it's particularly, you know, sort of, uh, uh, I mean, we've even seen bills in some states where uh, states were advocating uh, Legislation was was proposed, and this is not the Stop Book Act itself, but that would have prohibited student organizations from even bringing in speakers who espouse certain ideas. Right? Uh, I think that would clearly be uh, be unconstitutional. I think that's uh, all that to say uh, the the Stop Book Act can be largely constitutional and largely reflective of just um, the uh, the you know, base protections already in federal law, and at the same time. Um, have issues that are going to have to get resolved in the courts. Um, the only other thing I'd say is, at least in my experience, um, I, I mean, I, I have had conversations before and, and not uh, saying on the, with the present EEOC, but I know it, it can be quite challenging to, <laughs> to uh, get uh, the EEOC to engage on some of these issues at times, which is another reason why it can be helpful to have um, you know, multiple points of contact where you can engage. I had an experience once where someone from the EEOC, this has been quite a long time uh, ago, but someone from the EEOC told me that, uh, that they didn't actually uh, deal with religious discrimination claims. Uh, and I had to remind them it was literally part of the statute. So um, <laughs> it's a large organization. It's I'm a large organization. I say that so. that's not the, not the policy. <laughs> that's right, that's right, that's right. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, thank you for this. Uh, Great panel. Uh, I, my question is regarding what I'm noticing in the past few years among both social democrats and uh, conservatives, and we libertarians are in the middle, saying, everyone please uh, a little bit calm down in your approaches, uh, is the fact that it seems to me that nowadays, whether it is social democrats or uh, conservatives, they have started to cherry pick uh, the cases and the way that they apply free speech laws based on what I'm seeing, two primary things. The size of the corporation, and the second thing is whether or not we agree with the content of, contents of what is being said. Uh, we see a lot of conservatives in the Disney um, case that they are very much against the speech of uh, Disney Corporation, but when it comes down to uh, a small uh, businesses that for example, want to refuse to uh, give, um, uh, to, to take part in, in, in the uh, part of the social norms nowadays. Uh, well, we, we change our stance. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, how could we perhaps have a principle or a law or sets of laws that would prevent uh, legal entities or individuals to cherry pick and have a nice, uh, sets of laws that can be applied across different uh, cases without, uh, you know, having to have to always be in the middle of this talk of war uh, to <laughs> who is it applied to and who is it not. Now, that might be very uh, idealist to say, but, but, well, we have to reach for something as lawmakers. And we libertarians think we, we already got the answer, right? Uh, this government, remove the government, everything will work out. But Recently, I have come to realize that maybe that is not the semantics to the best approach, at least practically not. Maybe an idealist world would be great, but uh, it doesn't feel to me that, that someone like uh, an entity like ISIS should have a platform uh, in regards, even, even if the free speech laws uh, are applied to them. 
Um, and I want to so, make sure so that you're going to you're posing a question to the yeah, panel. Yeah, so 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 I'm confused with with what should we do about this? Like I, all I see is a tug of war. All I see is I'm on the side that agrees with me, and here are the laws that support my argument. And as long as soon as the the federal government has changed, or the business that we're talking about, the business entity that we're talking about has changed. Now I'm on the other side. What should we do about it? It seems to me that's not functional. Well, it's going to hurt everyone. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll take an initial stab at it. I think um, certainly to the extent that somebody's trying to cherry pick for an ideological difference, I think that that is just flatly wrong. Um, and I don't think that um, any principled First Amendment advocate would stand for that. So f to put a specific set of facts together, um, in our 303 creative case that, that I referenced earlier, you have a conservative Christian that had a message she found objectionable that she didn't want to create a website for. I think the same protection equally applies for a liberal Democrat who doesn't want to create a website with some message that they find objectionable. Um, and so I think that has to be a baseline. I frankly find that it is a baseline. I don't think folks are cherry picking on that basis. To the extent that some are drawing a distinction based on the size of the speaker, I think that could be a legitimate uh, consideration. I don't know that it should be dispositive, but it certainly can be something that courts consider. And I think that there's common law basis to do that in light of the, some of the, the common carrier uh, doctrine, some of the monopoly doctrines that that we see early on in the in the common law, and so I think on the size there really is a basis where we can look at that and draw some some realistic distinctions. But in terms of favoring one set of views over the other in the free speech realm, I think that 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 I I don't find principled First Amendment advocates doing that. So I, I think that people are are applying it equal ways on both sides. I would just add one last thing, which is that uh, a corporate form and corporate size might be distinct criteria to think about, and at least for purposes of RIFRA, whether widely held versus closely held corporations have RIFRA rights remains, as far as I can tell, an open question at the Supreme Court. And whether or not those principles apply similarly in the First Amendment also remains an open question. Well, and I would say on that point, I mean, I think that's, uh, in various ways, that's where the compelling interest test uh, or the you know, strict scrutiny comes in, right? All RIFRA or the, the First Amendment strict scrutiny gets you to is, uh, is uh, you know, the, the, the questions that you ask. And it's possible that those questions have different answers uh, in, in uh, different types of corporations, for example. Um, so the, you know, to, to say that the, the First Amendment applies or that First Amendment rights attach um, doesn't mean that they attach exactly in the same way to every speaker. That's that's not the case in any context. Um, I, I, I will say, I mean, kind of more broadly on your on your point, I, 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 maybe I've just sort of gotten comfortable with the idea that, um, like, look, uh, free speech is not normal. Um, throughout human history, no one, like, it, th this is the closest that the, the world has ever gotten to a place where people actually think uh, free speech should be protected and defended. Um, and through all of human history, this has been weird, the idea that I want to defend people who will attack me and I want to stand up for their right to do that is not something that people have historically thought made a lick of sense. Um, this is a, a relatively new experiment that we are trying. Um, and so I, I have at least, um, sort of gotten comfortable with the idea that, yeah, people are going to, to make arguments that I can point to and say, but that's inconsistent with the argument you made here, or why didn't you say something about that if you're concerned here? And that's all totally fair game. Um, but it shouldn't completely shock us um, that the world suddenly didn't turn into a, you know, uh, broadly free speech, you know, defending uh, paradise just because we wrote it down in the First Amendment. This is something, I mean, Ben Franklin said, you know, it's a republic if you can keep it, and the same applies to free speech. It's, it's going to require people to constantly be policing that, and people are going to fail. And I'm, I'm comfortable living in that world. <laughs> so. And we have time for one more question, the gentleman in the back. Sure. Kurt Levy with the Committee for Justice. The uh, Texas and Florida laws are basically anti-discrimination laws.
Um, and of course, we, we have plenty of that. I think the reason they're, you know, one of the reasons they're controversial is because they stand alone as separate laws aimed at social media. Um, what if conservatives who um, uh, want to regulate social media and banks and asset managers tried a somewhat different approach, tried just folding ideological discrimination into existing discrimination laws. Now there's a tiny bit of that, that now, you know, some states and localities, including DC, have, you, I don't think it's really, you can't discriminate based on ideology, but you can't discriminate based on party affiliation, at least in employment and public accommodations. Um, and of course, the, just like with every other type of discrimination, there'd be all kinds of evidentiary issues. But um, what do you think about that approach from a legal point of view and, and from a sort of public relations uh, political point of view? I, I've thought it's always a curious thing about American law, and I just sit there and observe it. I don't judge it as good or bad, that we will allow people to do something for any reason at all, except for particular ones that we don't like. Uh, and that's true across a number of different dimensions. You know, Congress can remove a subsidy from a certain industry because they want to subsidize a different one, but not because they dislike the political view of that particular industry, for example. Or you can fire somebody for any reason at all, but not because of their religion. I do think that that poses a particular First Amendment challenge because ideology is such a broad and difficult term to nail down. And so I would imagine that the first lawsuit filed against such a law would involve a void for vagueness challenge as well as an overbreath challenge under the First Amendment, making the claim that, well, you know, party affiliation is something you can nail down, religious affiliation, we have some body of law to hold on to for that. And of course, race and sex, that's something that is largely self-evident in most instances. Uh, how do we nail down what someone's ideology is and whether you're firing or hiring or deplatforming or debanking on that basis? Nevertheless, I think that if you can't think for yourself, you can't govern yourself. And if you lack effective freedom, the ability to say what you think, lest you lose access to critical infrastructure and you stop having the effective freedom to be able to live an ordinary life, that free speech culture that Casey talked about is fragile and rare and precious and can go away, but for the vigilance of those who protect it. I, I think what I would add is there's a bit of a distinction in my mind between various entities that would fall under one of these non-discrimination laws. So if you're dealing with a bank, for instance, that's providing bank accounts, Something like that could make a lot more sense than if you tried to apply it in the employment context to an advocacy group or a think tank where you obviously should be able to draw distinctions based on people's ideology. So the one thing I would say, and I, I don't think I'm a fan of that approach, but if I were to entertain it, I would say it would, it would require a lot of ex exemptions in order to, to make it work. Certainly a ministerial exemption. Yeah. Um, I, uh, Mm -hmm. your, your comment reminded me of um, Judge Justice Harlan's famous dissent in the civil rights cases. Um, that, of course, the, the court there ruled that um, you know the um, uh, Reconstruction Civil Rights Act only applied to government entities in a narrow way, not to private entities. And Harlan, drawing on you know the vibrant 19th century law of common carrier, said, "Look, you know there are all sorts of things that you need, as, as, as um, Eliot said." to live a normal life in society. You know, you have to go to, um, you know, trains and, and hotels, you mentioned, and he said places of public amusement, which I'm still not sure what they are, what he was talking about, but they sound fun. Um, and uh, so, I, I mean, I think that's right. Um, on the other hand, you know, I, I, even though I, I, you know, I, am, I am for, you know, Regulating social media, media, I mean, I'm still basically a Republican. It would be nice to narrow and limit regulation as much as possible, so. Of two minds to your question. I, I mean, look, I mean, I, I think you know part of the challenge with the the, the sort of ideological uh, or or political. Um, I mean, even like you know, DC has a well, DC prohibits like discrimination on virtually every possible basis, which has meant that it had to acknowledge that most of those things uh, are sort of paper protections that don't really mean what they would seem to mean, or otherwise no one could ever make any decisions on any basis. But among the, I mean, part of the challenge, like ADF has had some of these situations that have come up where um, some localities, I think Madison, Wisconsin, for example, um, 
would have would have required a uh, pro-life videographer to uh, you know to uh, uh, do videos that were pro-choice, right? Um, and I, so, I, I mean, my my mo on these things going to be going back to the, the administrative state is I, I think about you know with all due respect to our uh, EEOC colleague who was here, um, I, it's difficult for me to imagine brand new power put in the hands of the government and I will like 51% of the decisions that they make. I am virtually certain that if I can't see around all those corners, that we'll end up with another panel in 10 years talking about um, you know, the, the grotesque abuses that have come from this power that we handed to whatever agency to regulate in this way. Um, and I've, I've, seen nothing, I've seen nothing in recent history that would dissuade me from believing that that is the reality. All right, well, thank you. Um, I'm going to thank all the panelists for being here today, and thank you to the audience for joining us. A reminder that the final panel, titled Academic Freedom in Higher Education, the Role of States Defending Freedom of Thought, will start at 3.45. Thank you so much, Doug.